It looks like it's doing for me. There we go. Boom. Boom. All right. Here we go. All right. Y'all ready? We're gonna. So we're we're moving it. We we started the book of Revelation last week. We studied the whole book of Daniel. We've been talking about end time prophecy and what to expect uh, as we near the end. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that's going to happen tomorrow. What I am trying to tell you, though, is that we've been talking about the end days for a long time. We've been in the end days. Really, technically, the end days started when Jesus showed up. But we're getting closer and closer. There's a lot of strange things that are going on in the world. And uh, I think that some of you, I'm sure, have caught on to that. Amen. And so we finished Daniel and now we're moving into the book. Last week we talked about that the word revelation is where we get the word apocalypse. And, you know, I guess you could say the big reveal. That's what the book of Revelation means. It means the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it says every eye is going to see him. Behold, he comes in the clouds. There's going to be a day, and I've already made this point before, but I want to make it again. There's going to be a day when all the guesswork is going to be gone. So many of you that have chosen by grace when you heard the gospel, somebody witnessed to you to give your heart and life to Jesus, and you've been believing in God through Christ, through faith, whether we're, at, we're all at different levels of that in our understanding, and many times you'll, you will experience some level of persecution. Some people will laugh at you. They will scoff at you. Some people, you know, you, you just don't know what you might encounter. If you take a stand for the Lord, if you're willing to tell people, hey, I'm a servant of the Lord. Amen. And I'm excited by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit to tell people that. But one day, all the laughing is going to stop, my friend. I'm just telling you what the book says. One day, there will no longer be any laughing, no more scoffing. It's going to be very somber and it's going to be very serious and it's going to be very sobering. And that's kind of like what the whole book of Revelation is about. It's very somber, but at the same time, there's a lot of hope and a lot of joy in it because we understand that God's will is coming to pass. Amen? All right. So now we're starting into a new phase. Last week, again, we've talked about the book of Revelation. It explained to us that the book of Revelation was a message that was given by the Father, and it was, and, and, and it was to the Son, Jesus, and it came through his angel, talking about Jesus' angel. I want to clarify something on that, by the way, before we're done here. And that through the angel, it was given to John. And I made, I don't know if my head wasn't screwed on right last week, but I made some kind of comment. I was thinking about it later. I said, look, this is Jesus' angel. Some people say, y'all might have an angel. They're all Jesus' angel, man. I don't know what I was thinking. What? what? Jesus ain't got one angel. All, all principality, all power. They were created by him because before he became flesh, he was the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence. That's what it says in Colossians. That's what it says in Hebrews. He is the word that spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke creation into existence and all principality and power. That's talking about all angels, both good and bad, have been placed under his dominion and under his feet. He is all powerful. Amen. All right. So you got to excuse an imperfect man who's going to say a lot of imperfect things, but we're going to try to get it right. Amen. By the grace of God. All right. So now we're going into the churches and we're going to learn some things before we get started in this. I just want you to know that these are literal churches. Let me see if I can find my little, my little maps. Don't look at all my other pictures. Look how pretty my daughter is, though. She, this is her nursing. Yeah, y'all need to, y'all need to pray for her that the Lord would lead her and guide her in truth, Amen, and that she wouldn't be caught up in the lies of the secularist education system. All right, here we go. So this is, can you see this right here? I hope you can. Let me kind of try to move this over a little bit. You see where it says Syria and Judea? That whenever I draw that little map on the board, though. Let me tell you, I got to tell you something. Y'all may not like this, but if you don't know where you are, then you don't know how to talk about it, okay? Um, and whenever I draw this little thing here, this is supposed to be Israel in between here. All this right here, this is the Mediterranean Sea, okay? Egypt is down here. What, but I want you to know, you see this little, I don't know, I used to have a psychology teacher. I don't like psychology, but I used to have a teacher. His name was Dean Boudreaux. And he would call this a chut chut. You see how this is out here and it extends into the Mediterranean Sea? You know what this is? When I draw that, I draw for a, person, a purpose. This is Mount Carmel. Does anybody remember anything about Mount Carmel? That's where Elijah had to shut down with the prophets. It's a very, very important place, okay? That was a, uh, 
As a matter of fact, I just happened to be talking a little bit about Jezebel tonight. That's where Elijah had his showdown with Jezebel's false prophets right there, Mount Carmel. This is, this is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. But what we're focused on tonight is this area, this area of land called Asia Minor. And over here, this is where, I, this is a bad picture of it, but that's supposed to be Italy. So this is the west, that's the east, right? And I wanted you to see, uh, to have a reference point, that Syria over there in Judea is actually that little thing I was drawing, but the little should just a little bit smaller, but you see it up there. And then I wanted to give you a reference point to Israel, but where we're focused right now is right here in this area here, Asia Minor, off here to the left, and the seven churches, seven literal churches that were here, okay? So these were seven literal churches, and John was actually overseer of many of them. And right now, where John gets this revelation about the, about Jesus Christ, I told you last week, he was a prisoner on the island called Patmos. The church fathers say that he was, he was stuck in a mine, and he had to mine. And it was during this time frame, while he was on the Isle of Patmos, that the, that the revelation of Jesus Christ was given to him. And it, he was told to write it down for the church, which is for you and I. And I got to tell you that I believe it was for such a time as this. It was for such a time as this because I do believe, and I'm not going to shrink back from it, that we're experiencing the end of the end. And it's important for God's people to be prepared and to understand where they are in the time frame of human history. Amen? The, 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 the mission has never changed. Make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the closer we get, the more important it is that we understand, all right? So these are seven literal churches. But what I need you to know is, is that this is, and this, this is my belief, and, and not just mine alone, but the more I study it, the more I realize that within each of these churches, the things that Jesus says to them and about them is relevant for the whole church age. So what I'm about to tell you is, is that Jesus gives both commendations, which means a compliment, an attaboy kind of, you can say. You did a good job tonight, Shelby boy, that shoulder's making its comeback, amen? I'm just, no, I'm serious. I mean, you did, and I can, and I can see your shoulders getting back, amen? But, but what I'm trying to say is a commendation, you did good, right? Uh, 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 this is where you did it right. And then a condemnation. So you did good, but, okay? See, that's why I got a problem with preachers that won't tell the whole story. Amen? And, and, and listen, whenever you hear me say something that I'm probably preaching to myself before I'm preaching to you. Amen? So, so never leave out of this place like, man, he was beating me up. No, 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 no. The word of God beats me up just before it beats you up. Okay? If it's beating somebody up is what I'm trying to say. It brings correction is what it does. The word of God says that the Lord chastens those whom he loves. He wants to correct you on Amen. So there's commendations and then there's condemnations. You did this right. You did that wrong. And through the church age, I will tell you that every single church that really wanted to serve the Lord in some way, shape or form did good. Some things right, but also did some things wrong. Just like you as individual Christians through the, the lifespan of your Christianity, you've done some things right, but you've also done some things wrong. It's not bad for the Lord to correct us through his Holy Spirit and through his word. Because guess what? Correction allows change to take place. Amen. And so I want you to know that I do believe with that said that these passages that we're going to read about these churches. It's not only it's not only relevant for the churches of all time in the church age, but it's also relevant for your life and for my life. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead. The first church is. Is, is the church of Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand. Now we talked about what the seven stars were last week. The seven stars the, uh, talk, said it was the angels. And we talked about the word angel and that it can also be translated as a man. So many, most scholars believe that it's talking about the pastors of these churches. Um, and I told you my opinion last week that I believe that there's Angels over churches, spiritually speaking, but there's pastors over churches because he wanted to give the message to the leadership of the church. And Jesus is the one that's seen as holding those stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the candlesticks were the seven churches, right? And we kind of tried, I, I didn't spend too much time on it, but there was a, 
there's a word called menorah. It was a lampstand. It was in the holy place, and it lit up the holy place in the Old Testament, which was the tabernacle, which housed the presence of God. Now, what does that have to do with anything, preacher? Well, real quick, i got to be careful. I don't overwhelm you with a bunch of information. But let me just say this. The Old Testament tabernacle was a portable, moving house for the presence of God. The Word of God says, I'm going to fast forward through it real fast, that Jesus, it says it in, it says, in the beginning was the Word, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelled amongst us. The word in the Greek for dwelled there, you could say he tempted or tabernacled with us. When Jesus died on the cross, the, he said this. He said, you know him, talking about the Holy Spirit. He was telling his disciples, you know him for he has been with you, but he will be in you. See, he was talking about when I die on the cross and I pay the final payment of sin and, and all sin is, 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 is atoned for. And then this gospel message goes forward and somebody hears the truth and they receive that truth by faith. Guess what? Hallelujah. Now you get sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your home. And if you got saved tonight, you know what I'm talking about, my friend. You know what I'm talking about because you are not the same as you used to be. Amen. Amen. All you might have had your struggles. We all have. But I guarantee you, you're not the same person that you used to be. Amen. And so he's and so that tabernacle, that tent was an Old Testament type of the believer today. Well, what are you talking about? You were just talking about Jesus. Yes. The Old Testament tent. Listen, they would pick that tent up and they would walk, right? He said, you'll see the pillar of fire by day and the the, and uh, I'm sorry, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of uh, the cloud by day, and you will follow me. So I pack up that tent and they follow the presence of the Lord. And the presence of God lived on the inside of that, on the inside of that tent. And then, then the presence of God tinted in Jesus. And then after Jesus died and we got saved, the Holy Spirit lives in us. And now guess what we are? We are a walking tabernacle. Can I say that? Amen. Can I say that we are the temple? Did you not know that you are the temple of the living God? Amen. Right. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And not only that, Jesus said this in Matthew 5. He said, you are the light of the world. Yeah. See, just that same light that was in the tabernacle that lit the area so the high priest could know what he needed to do. Guess what? The work of God is being manifest through your life. And you are the light of the world. Amen. Hallelujah. Let your light shine before men and let it glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. That's what God wants for each and every one of us. Praise God, if you ever work, if you ever teach the kids, hallelujah, we need you. If you clean the church, hallelujah, we need you. If you keep the books, whatever, you, we need you. But we know what we really need. We need people just to do what God's called them to do. What's he called me to do, preacher? Be a light in the midst of a darkened world. Let Jesus shine his light through you. Amen? And guess what? He never asked you to do it on your own. He gave you the Holy Spirit to give you the strength. Amen? So he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which are the churches. He says, I know your works and your labor. See, right now he's talking about the commendation. This is the good stuff you did. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and how you can't bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Wow. This is, this is Jesus talking right here. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored. And you haven't fainted. Nevertheless, here comes the condemnation. I have somewhat against you because you left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen and repent and do the works or else I will come unto you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of his place. Except you repent. But this you have. So now it's, it's almost like it's going back to another commendation. This you have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then he has this message. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says this almost after every church. He says, to him that overcomes, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, so here we go. This is, this is the church that is called the church of Ephesus. And so what, one of the first things that I want to talk to you about is what is in the commendation. He said this. He said that you 
He said, you work. He, this, is, this is the commendation. I see your works. I know your works and your labor. Now, just real quick, and I mean, if anybody wants to answer, that'd be great. You don't have to. You don't, I can do it for you. Whenever you think of works, though, you know, this should be interactive. Church should be interactive. When you think of works, what do you think of, you know? And, and, and again, it's kind of rhetorical, but it's, it's maybe to, make you, to cause you to contemplate, to think. Huh? Teaching. Te te teaching is a work, yes. There are all kinds of things that we do in the church can, can be works, right? But one of the things that I think that I've come to realize is, is that every work that's performed in a church should in some way, shape, or form help, should be for the purpose of augmenting the work of God. Or, fancy word, helping to move forward the work of God. What is the work of God? Making disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's work on earth is to get this true gospel message the way that it's written by God to those out there. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the work of God. Amen. And God wants that work to be done. Amen. He says, I know your works and your labor. It's not just like a little bit of work, but it was like laborious. It was, they were, they were toiling, you know, sometimes the work of the Lord. That's what I want to, I can see whenever it, this is like base. You remember whenever you used to play tag when you were young? Okay. When I stand behind this pole, but this is like base, you know what that means? You, you, you can't touch me. I'm allowed to say what the truth when I'm standing behind this sacred desk. Amen. Is that fair? Amen. That's fair. It should be fair. I'm allowed to say the truth, and you're, and, you're, and you're allowed to receive it by the grace of God. Amen? Sometimes we just get tired. You know? Man, life is rough, dude. I got this job, and they just make me work so hard. I'm just too tired to go to church. And that ain't going to cut it, boss. We're all tired. We're all wore out. Sometimes I just feel a little bit bad. Okay, well, how bad do you feel? Because I'm just trying to say that the word of the Lord will heal you. Amen? The, the anointing of the presence of God can and will heal you. He is still a healer. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? I don't say nothing enough to get you riled up, my friend. I know. I, I signed up. Okay? But I am trying to make a point. I know because I was sitting in them chairs... And there was times and seasons in my walk with God that the least little thing would keep me out of the house of God. Okay? And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I kind of commended Naya the other day because what well, she said, her wrist hurt. <laughs> she said her wrist was hurting. And she's over there working construction. She's on the ladder up in the air. And it just so happened that right where that nail she shot hit another nail. And pow! That thing came back and busted her lip. She had... Her tooth, I don't think it was loose. <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't get her some dental care. But she was, she was bleeding all over the place. And she was like, man, old devil trying to get me not to show up tonight. Well, praise the Lord, sister. So I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. I'm really not. I'm just being real. There should be very little that keeps us out of the house of God. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and even if you don't like coming to this church, you should find a church that you like going to and you should faithfully attend. Now, that doesn't mean that if you miss church because you're going through things and you got legit stuff going on in your life. Come on, we don't preach works here. Amen? Amen. Right. We don't preach that way. We get it. You know, I get it. All right, so works, laborious works, endurance. You know, that's that word hupomone again in the Greek. It means to remain under. Listen, the toil and the trial and the labor of working for the Lord and the enemy attacking you as you try to do that, sometimes it gets rough. Amen? The, the enemy will try to do whatever he can to prevent you from moving forward in the ways of God. And then he goes on to say that you won't bear the burden of evil. In other words, you're not going to put up with it. You know, I believe that that's a good message for each and every one of us in our walk with God, that the world has a way of enticing us. Now, now listen, the spirit of the world is evil. You do, you do agree with that. Now, does it always show itself so obviously? No, it does not. No, it doesn't. Thank you, brother. Matter of fact, most of the time, it's like so beautiful. It's like scintillating. It's got these, you know, smells good, looks good, tastes good, sounds good. Okay, everything about it, it just seems so good. And it's so tricky on the front end. Tricky, tricky, tricky. You know? And it's like, it's so inviting. It says, come on in. Yeah. Come on in. 
And it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal at first. And then you open up the door and you walk in. And then the next thing you know, you can't get out. You can't get out as easily as you thought you was going to be able to get out. Oh, I'm just going to tap tiptoe up in here and do like a little a little pirouette a couple times and hang out for a little. No, 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 no. You're going to stay here for a while, my friend. And I just want to tell you, we ought to not be putting up with evil. We need the wisdom of God through the word of God to, to recognize the evil that is in this world that is trying to dress itself. <clears throat> Listen, if Satan presents himself as an angel of light and so do his ministers then I got to tell you that he is tricky yeah. and we just, and we need the wisdom of God. Amen. That we wouldn't walk into a trap. Praise God. And then he says, you put to test lying preachers. You know, you can't just believe everything that you hear. What the preacher is preaching must line up with the word of God. Well, how do I know? Well, can I, I'm behind the sacred desk. You should be reading your Bible, my friend. Now, I can't say that enough. You should be reading your Bible. Okay, don't get mad at me. Don't get mad because, listen, I was a Christian for 12 years and barely cracked it open. The only time I cracked it open was when I was in offshore. At least, you know why I was cracking it open then? Because, like, I didn't want to go down, I didn't want to go into the galley and watch porn. By the grace of God, I was saved enough to know I probably ought to not be in the galley with all them other dudes watching pornography. So I'd stick myself up in the, on my top bunk and I'd open up the Bible and it was usually to the book of Romans. And they come in there and they clown me. Oh, come on, man. I got to eat it. Pick up all these stuff. I wish I would have had the boldness then that I got now. Oh, man. It would have been a whole different story then, brother. Let me tell you. Anyway, don't put up with evil. But how are you going to know what's evil versus what is good unless you put the word of the Lord on the inside of your heart? Amen. I'm going to do my best to teach the word of God, to preach the word of God, to teach the truth. But it's helpful when the people of God... Put the word of God on the inside of their heart. It helps to really illuminate and for us to learn much more rapidly. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And they did all of this for the name of Jesus. They bore the burden and they didn't grow weary. He said, but I got this problem. You left your first love. You left your first love. And, and, and you know, one of the things that 1 Corinthians says, you know, I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. But if I have not love, then I become a tinkling brass and a clanging cymbal. <clears throat> Amen. We don't want to be a tinkling brass and a clanging cymbal. So listen, under the commendation again, what does he say? You hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You remember that when I read that just now? I've said this before, but this word, if you, if you broke it down in, in the Greek, it would say this. It would say, uh, Nico is, is control or victory over. And the Laetans, this right here. And the laetans is the people. Okay? So basically what that word means, if you break it down, control over the people. And, you know, one, I was sharing with this lady last night. Well, I talked to her probably for an hour talking about Jesus. Uh, it was a roof. I went to go get the... And I, mean, I witnessed to this lady for, for an hour. She, she told me she was Catholic in the end. But, but, the, but the, the main point is, is that... I was talk, started talking to her about the spirit of religion. And, I mean, dude, I, I don't even know how I got off on all this stuff. Started talking about the spirit of religion. And one of the things that I've noticed about the spirit of religion, it doesn't want to let people go. Right. It doesn't want to let people go free. Oh. Amen. A control spirit. That's right. That's what this is saying. Jesus is saying, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Control of the people. Now, this is one of the things that I've noticed. This isn't just in Catholicism. That's right. This That's is right. in Protestantism. Oh, yeah. They got pastors behind pulpits that if they find out you went visiting at another church, they're going to throw a fit. Well, you ought to not be going to listen. If you know the word of the Lord and you feel like the Lord's leading you, I mean, I hope that you come back and that you want to come to church here. I really do. But there, there's nothing wrong with people being able to find out where the Lord's calling them to be. And if I got a problem with that, there's a problem with me. Yeah. Yeah. Because, see, you don't belong to me. Amen. You belong to the Lord. He's the great shepherd. He laid down his life for you. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you this. I don't want to be a hireling. A hireling flees when the wolf comes. I want to be an under shepherd. Amen. I want to do the work of the Lord and I want to help to lead people in the truth of God. Amen. But, but I don't want to control people. You know, my life is busy and messy enough. I don't have to have no control over nobody. Right. I want, amen? Right. Lord, I, I, I want to give 
give God control over my life. I don't want to control nobody. Praise God. All right, so you get the point. All right, let's move on. We're going to, he that has an ear to hear, what he says, listen, he that overcomes, because each message, there's a message for the overcomer. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. One of the things that I was noticing as I was studying this morning is, is that each message, each message to the overcomer, I believe is showing us things that are going to be for the hereafter. Now, y'all have already heard what my position is becoming as far as my understanding of when the rapture is going to take place. I'm really starting to, to believe that this is not going to necessarily be a pre-trib rapture. Now, I'm going to, if you hang around with me long enough, I'm going to give you some food for thought. Now, you may not agree with me by the time it's over with, and, that, and I'm okay with that. Uh, we don't have to agree on everything. We better agree on the deity of Jesus and the fact that That's he right. died and atoned for all sin. Right. And if I don't give you the scripture to back it up, and whenever I see other things that are in here where I see that pre-tribulationists can make their point, I'm going to point it out. I'm not going to try to hide it from you. Amen? Because I just want us all to seek the truth. Period. Because the last thing you want... And the last thing I want is for us to think it's going to go down one way and it ends up going down the other way. Whoa, Houston, we really have a problem. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? That's right. Thank you, Shelby. I was about to cause a catastrophe. <laughs> so this part here is, is that he that overcomes, well, what are you overcoming? You know, just think about that. What are you overcoming? I mean, there's a lot of things that, but you... You got he you got to overcome until the end whatever the end is let's just leave that blank right now but an overcomer is one that that wins in the victory whatever that looks like and to the one that overcomes he's going to give him to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of garden now the tree of life started off in the garden of eden we know that and it sat alongside the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but it's also in the it's also during in the new heavens and the new earth and, and it has the leaves that heal the nations. And the whole purpose of the tree of life was that man would never die. And whether or not it's completely symbolic or if we're actually eating of something to keep it. I don't really know all of that. One day we will, praise God. But I just want you to know that this, this, this idea of this tree of life is that he that overcomes is going to be a partaker of eternal life. The eternal life of God. Amen. So that's what I want you to get out of that. All right, now we're going on to Smyrna. I mean, it's going to take at least two lessons to teach all seven of these churches. We'll just see where we get tonight. I promise not to keep you too long. Amen? It says, Up to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write these things. It says, The first and the last, which was, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt. Of the second death. There's a lot right there. When you just read that kind of slow. Is there not? Yes. You know. So uh, this is what he says. He, he, he says that I know your work. So again he sees the works of this church. And he sees the tribulation that they've endured. Now this literal church. Would have endured literal tribulation. But can I tell you. That most churches have endured tribulation. I hope that you're okay with this because I'm very happy that I was born in America. As much as I, not as, not as much, that's not true. But let me say this. I am very happy. Well, first of all, I'm so ecstatic that I've been born again into the kingdom of God. I really am when I think about what God has done in my life. But I am glad that I was born in America. Why? Why do you say that? Because I turned 10 in Singapore and Asia is pretty cool, but I don't want to live there. I went to the Western Europe. I've been to Holland. I've been to Norway. Uh, you know, I don't want to live there. Uh, I've been to Venezuela and I've been to Mexico on more than one occasion. All nice places, great food. Yep, I don't want to live there. I love being an American. And being an American has afforded me certain liberties. And it has allowed me 
certain, you know, and one, but one of the things that it's done though, in a negative sense is for the longest time, I was blinded by an American gospel. Mm. You see, an American gospel that kind of got me soft in my way of thinking and made me to believe that because I was an American, bad stuff was never going to happen to me. And the reality of it is, my friend, is that that is just not reality. Amen. Reality is that the church has suffered tribulation. It's just that as of yet, you and I haven't really seen it like that. Last year, I mean, and again, I'm not trying to be overkill with this. I'm really not. I'm just trying to, like, communicate reality, truth. Last year, the Syrian Christians, and even here more recently again, all they had to do was renounce their faith. But instead, they were thrown into cages and caught on and set on fire. Okay, that's... That's tribulation. The word tribulation means to be pressed. You know, it, what was interesting is Danielle sent me this thing today. I thought it was so good. I read it. It was about Corey Ten Boom. Y'all ever heard of her? What's the name of that place? The Hyden Place? The, that book, The Hyden Place. The story of Corey Ten Boom was that her father was a Christian. And I don't remember where they lived, but it was somewhere in Europe during, during Nazi Germany. And they were hiding Jews. Her family was hiding Jews. And the story that she sent me, Corey said something like, Daddy, I can't, oh Lord, I can't remember what it said. <laughs> Maybe I should just read it. They always out preach me over here. <laughs> it's okay. Let me see. <laughs> I thought this was good. Just hang tight. All right, here we go. This is what it says. It says, uh, it says, one day Car Car Corey was playing with her dolls in the living room and her father, Casper, sat in his comfortable chair next to the fireplace. Papa, I will never be strong enough to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm too frightened, Papa. Corman, I guess that's what he called him. Come sit with me. Corey nestles herself safely in her dad's arms. When does Papa give you your train ticket when we are traveling from Harlem to Amsterdam? Just before we get on board, Papa, I only need it at that time, don't I? You're right, Corman. That is what it will be like when the Lord Jesus allows you to suffer for his name's sake. You will receive power the moment you need it. Huh. Comforted, Corey continues to play with her dolls. Wow. Danielle was making the point. She says, I don't feel like I'm a very courageous person. And, and I told her, I said, I can, receive, I can receive what you're saying because in my own little mind, sometimes I feel like maybe I am kind. But I've thought this through. I've thought the end through. I'm just telling you, that's how my brain works. I don't stop at point A. I go all the way to Z. And I think it through. And you can think you're courageous all you want. <laughs> you can think you're the toughest guy on the block. You can think whatever you want to think. But there's some things on this earth that will grip your heart with fear. Oh, yeah. yep. And when it comes down to it, you will need the grace and the help of the Lord. Yeah. Yes. And that is a very encouraging word because listen, the next time she, and she, she goes on to say, and after I was in that Nazi concentration camp, I would oftentimes think about the words that my father spoke. You know, God used that woman in a mighty way and you know, whatever we have to face. And I'm not even saying we're going to face all that, but guess what? We need to have our hearts prepared. Amen. Amen. He goes on to say that I see your poverty, but you're rich. I just want to real quickly say this is that the world's perception of riches is not the same as God's perception of riches. Amen. How many times do we have to say that when we preach a Christmas message, we always bring out the point that Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, was not born in a, in a castle. He was born in a manger. Yeah. He was not dressed in silken clothes like a king would be. Instead, he was wrapped Probably in a burlap, in burlap. Yeah. He did not ride into town on a white stallion like a king would do. He rode into town on a donkey. Do you think that God accidentally did all that? No. no. He did it for a purpose. That's right. To reveal to you and I. Yeah. Amen. That, that this gospel message and that this kingdom of God on this end of glory is not supposed to look like the way that this world is trying to make it look. Amen. So for you, you watch whatever you want on TV as far as preachers go. <clears throat> But for me, I hadn't watched a preacher on TV in a long time, but I guarantee you one thing, if I see them up there sitting on gold thrones oh, and gold yeah. laced everywhere, and they talking about send me your $1,000 seed harvest and you're going to get your spiritual lottery, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm changing the channel. Yeah. 
Yep. Because I ain't got no time. It's just ridiculous. God help us. Yes, help us, Lord. Because most people are caught up in it. He goes on to say, you're putting up with the persecution from people that say they are Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. I could spend a lot of time on this, but let me just say this. Everything that calls itself Jew isn't Jew. Just like everything that calls itself Christian isn't Christian. When you turn on the TV and you see those Jews that are at the Wailing Wall and they got those little ringlet curls, those people are not even, that's not even true Judaism. I need you to understand that. You can go home and do your own Googling and your own research. They call that Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a mystical form of Judaism that is an occultic religion. It's all so shrouded. It's all so, so easily deceiving. All this stuff started back whenever the children of Israel left Egypt and all that stuff had previously come from Canaan into Egypt. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that the, these Jewish God, Jesus himself is saying you've been persecuted by these people that call themselves Jews, but they're not even Jews. They're up in the synagogue of Satan. And this thing is still alive today. This whole world is, is under a spell. I'm here to tell you. Oh, you sound so extreme. That's because I am. I am because I believe that I can see it. And then he goes on to say this. He says, the devil will cast some of you into prison for 10 days. Now, whether or not you believe you're, that that's for the church or you believe that the church is going to be out of here, that's fine. Whatever, whatever your position is. But he said, some of you, he, yes, he's speaking to a literal church. But I've already told you, my opinion is that this has to do with the church of all days. They will all, to some extent, suffer some persecution. There have been Christians throughout the years that have been thrown into prison. And that 10 day thing, we've already talked about this a little bit when we were in Daniel. But you remember what happened in Daniel? Whenever, the, whenever Nebuchadnezzar took the Hebrew boys out of, Jer out of Jerusalem and brought them to Babylon. And they were in the prison cell. Or wherever they were. It doesn't say they were in a prison cell. They were, they were encamped in an area. And the, and the king wanted them to eat his meat and to drink his wine. And Daniel said, no. We, we won't do it. Test us in this. And it was a 10-day period. The number 10 days is used repeatedly in Scripture. I'm just going to mention two of them right now as a time of testing. You understand? So, so what I need you to know is, is that I'm not saying that this is a literal 10-day period. What I'm saying is that, that, that 10 days represents a time of testing. So, there, so the idea could be that persecution is coming upon the earth at some point in time in the church age. And that there's a time of testing that has to take place. Again, in Leviticus 23, 27, it starts with the, the, the Feast of Trumpets in Leviticus 23. And then 10 days later is the Day of Atonement. And the 10 days in between, the Jews still memorialize this or observe it. It's called the 10 days of awe, where they're getting their hearts right in preparation for the Day of Atonement. When that animal will be killed and his blood applied and sin is forgiven. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life in the Greek is the Stephanos. You remember those little, those little olive leaf things for the winter. That's for the winter. So if you're an overcomer and you overcome until the end, you get a crown of life. Amen. He that overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. I just want you to know that. If you are a believer, amen, and you go to sleep the way the Bible calls it in Christ. That means you die in Christ. You're not gonna you're not gonna be awakened for the great white throne judgment. That's a thousand years later. That's after the millennial reign of Jesus. No, you're gonna be awakened for the rapture of the church, the resurrection. Those that are dead in Christ will rise first. So for those that overcome, you will you will, you will not take part in the second death, which is the great white throne judgment, which means you won't be judged for sin. Well, why won't I be judged for sin? Because Jesus was judged for you. That's right. Amen? Amen? When you, that's, I mean, like, I'm not trying to call it, let's make a deal or something. I don't want to be irreverent, but I mean, how are you going to get a better, how would you get a better situation than that? Over and over again in the word of God, God says it. He allowed your sin, my sin, to be placed upon the innocent one. That's what got me saved. I was in that message when the sister Till was preaching and I told that lady that last night in her, in her kitchen. I said, this woman kept saying the blood and it made me feel all weird. And I knew it was making her feel weird. So I kept doing it. I said, she kept saying blood, blood. And I said, I didn't know what to think. I, I think this, the, the demon spirits wanted me to get them leave because what happened next changed my life. 
She said the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. Yeah. Oh, ho, ho. what a beautiful story. I was born of Adam and I was born in sin. But hallelujah, I've been born again. Amen. Amen. Somebody told me the good news of Jesus. Amen. And when I heard it and I received it, good news. it changed me. Amen. Amen. It saved me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. You're going to rise, amen, in the resurrection. Yes. You're not going to rise at the great white throne. Jesus has already paid the penalty for you. <clears throat> if you're saved tonight, I'm just telling you that on the video. If you're saved tonight, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if not, you can invite him in right now, amen. Say, Jesus, I need you. Be a good time to practice getting on our knees, too. Amen. We're so staunch and so, like, you know. That's not proper <laughs> to get on my knees in the presence of the Lord. Help us. Break us, Lord. Amen. Break me. All right. Let's move on. We're going to Pergamos. We still got a little time. Y'all hang in there. Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, says he which has the sharp sword with two edges. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seed is, and you'll hold fast my name. And I mean, can you imagine? We live, listen, we live in the midst of a society. I'm telling you right now, if I started listing off all the stuff in Hollywood and the music industry, the stuff that we're being pounded with, mm -hmm. we are being pounded with. Now, you know, keep saying they're about to kick you off of YouTube. Well, let them kick me off. I mean, who cares? I mean, they ain't that many people watching me. Homosexuality abounds. Oh, why are you picking on the homosexual? I'm not picking on homosexuals. I'm just trying to say, okay, adultery abounds, fornication abounds, drug use abounds, alcoholism abounds. Every time we turn around, something is abounding. Sin is abounding. We live in the midst of an evil society. Amen. Can we say that? I mean, I don't like it any more than you do. This world has fallen. And they keep, they, but the problem is, is that they're trying to convince us that it's normal. They're trying to convince us that this is normal behavior. And they're doing a pretty good job of it, I hate to say. Because people are becoming more and more comfortable with it. I know I'm telling you the truth. He says, and you have not denied my faith. So even in the midst of a godless society with all of these things going on, there are believers that do not deny the faith. Amen. Yeah. There are believers that stand strong for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then look, it even says, wherein Antipas my, was my faithful martyr, he was slain amongst you where Satan dwells. So you, you, you hold him true to, the, to my name. You haven't denied the faith. You live in the midst of a godless society. You even saw Antipas the martyr die. And you still didn't back off. Amen. But, he, but look what he says. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed to idols. And to commit fornication. You also have... People that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We've already talked about that. So what about this Balaam guy? This Balaam and this Balaam guy. Y'all remember that story? That's all the way back in Numbers, if I'm not mistaken. Numbers 24, Numbers 25. Balaam was a false prophet. And he was for hire for the king. Balaam, the king of the Moabites, hired him. And Balaam knew how to, to get a word from the Lord and... He was like trying to get God to be willing to curse him, curse the children of Israel. And God kept saying, no, I'm not cursing my own people. And, and Balaam kept going back. And that's where you remember, I said it the other day in the King James version of the Bible, the dumb ass spoke. That's where that comes from. The donkey spoke. Okay. I know I made a big joke on all that, but that's where the donkey spoke to the prophet because he wouldn't listen to God. So even God, sometimes, you know, people are like, well, he's got to be being used by God because he's got a church of 50,000 people. Look, God used a donkey. So, you know, Danielle said one time, like, even a broken clock is right twice in a 24-hour period. <laughs> so just, just because, you know, just because doesn't mean that it's so, right? That's right. And, and so, but what he did was he was persistent. See, that's how the devil is. I was trying to think about that today. The devil is never going to stop 
He's always looking for the path of least resistance. He's like water up against the dam. And he's just waiting for a little bit of a crack. And once he sees that crack, he's, he starts to issue himself in there. And he's never going to stop doing that. You need to understand that. And so what he's going to do is he's just looking for an opportunity and a way in to wreak havoc and to cause destruction. Because that's what he does. And what, what the word of the Lord would, would tell us about this situation with Balaam is that Balaam never quit. And if you finally, God tells him again and again and again, I'm not going to curse my people. I'm not going to curse my people. And then you, you feel like it's over with. But then Jesus tells us right here that it wasn't. Because when you go to chapter 25 of Numbers, you begin to, you, we don't have to go there, but you begin to realize that, you know what he did? He taught the children of Israel to marry the women of Moab, which they weren't supposed to do. Why? Because they, the women of Moab then taught their Hebrew husbands to worship false gods. That's why I'm going to say it. I've already told my children. They're getting older now. It's your job now to tell your children, do not be unequally yoked. Right. You're not supposed to yoke yourself with unbelievers. That's right. You're not supposed to allow this to happen, Christian. Why? Because they're going to influence you and bring you to the sacrifice of, uh, come on, man, you're getting crazy now. No, I mean, I'm meaning it in a way. They're going to bring you towards evil instead of towards God. They're going to bring you towards the ways of the world instead of the ways right. of God. Does that make sense? Right, yeah. I hope it does. He says, to him that overcomes, I will give him hidden manna. Boy, that's got to be some good stuff. Amen. And a white stone and a new name written on it. White stones versus black stones. Black stones used to show guilt. White stones, that was the way to, they would give a verdict back in the ancient days. If, if you went through the court system and you were found to be innocent, I'm not trying to say that this is the right interpretation, but it is an interpretation and it makes sense. Because the stone's white and you're innocent. Why are you innocent? Because of the blood of Jesus was shed for you. And in the end, he that overcomes, you're going to get a white stone. You're innocent, amen? And a new name written on it. Boy, I can sit here and preach on new names. Amen. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jacob meant deceiver. Israel meant one prince of God, one that will rule with God. God changed Paul's name from Saul, which means desire, to Paul, which means small. <laughs> small Paul. You know, he, Paul was kind of arrogant and he was kind of puffed up because he was real smart. God had a way of breaking yeah. him down too. Yeah. But maybe it's all connected to really Peter's name. Maybe. His name was Simon, which is a variant of Simeon and Simeon means to hearken or to listen. And then Peter means a rock. Small rock, but it means rock nonetheless. <laughs> and, and so here we see a man that would listen to the word of God. Amen. And his life built upon a rock. Praise God. And in the end, I want you to know the word of God said, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a white rock. And it's going to have a new name. Right now. <laughs> Amen. I don't know what my new name is going to be, but I know one thing I'm going to be excited to get to glory, amen, and to receive that white rock. <laughs> Praise God. All right, let's move on. We're going to try to get through this next one, and I promise you, you won't be here but about seven more minutes. You ready? <clears throat> he that has an ear to hear, he's going to give you the hidden manna. He's going to give you a white stone with a new name. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, says the Son of God. Now, now, now Jesus is presenting himself in a judgmental form here, he says, he has eyes like a flame of fire. His feet are like fine brass. You remember last week? I think it was last week. Oh, because in chapter one, it describes Jesus this way. And I can't tell you that, that this has anything to do with it. It's just, when I see out allegorical things in the Bible, what are you saying? Things that are under the surface. You know, when you start yeah. peeling layers back yeah. and you see yeah. something that you never saw before, those are the kind of things I think they kind of get me like really excited now. And I was up here preaching. And when I saw that, that his feet were like fine brass. And I understand that, that whenever it's burnished like that, it's because it's been tried in the heat uh -huh. and it comes out right on the other side. Right. And I remembered the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and how, how whenever they heated up the fiery furnace, the king looks over there and he's like, it looks like there's a fourth one in there. He looks like he's the son of man. And I was thinking, boy, isn't that something? See, Jesus, it was, that was, that was a, a, what you call a Christophany. 
That was the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament. And he was in the midst of that fiery furnace. Amen. And he made it. He made it through. I'm not trying to make more of it than what it needs to be. But let me just say this. He's already made it through his trial. And he's there to go with you good. through your trial. Good. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Word. Hallelujah. All right. Here we go. We're about to wrap it up. He says, I know your works and your charity. So there you go, works again. And your love. These people have love. And your service. That word is where we get deacon from, diakonos, okay? So serving the Lord, serving the church, serving the people. I don't know how you feel about serving people. I'm starting to love it. God had to do that to me because before I'd just rather be served. I'd rather you serve me. You see what I'm saying? But now I'm starting to learn how to love to serve people. Amen? And faith and patience in your works. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. What's, what, 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 you. what is this? Because you suffer or you put up with that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophet, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins. <coughs> you know that word reins? If you, if you was from the country, you know you call that? Your innards. Jesus says, I search the innards. The kidneys, the call, the liver, the intestines. I search it. I'm getting deep down in there and I'm looking. And, and you know what the Lord, you know what he's saying right here? He's talking about a church that isn't really operating like the church is supposed to operate. Now let's, let's kind of break this down just real quick. Seth. Because who is Jezebel? First of all, is this a literal Jezebel? Probably so. Probably a literal woman named Jezebel or else that's what they nicknamed her. But she was in a literal church and she was over there teaching a false gospel. And in the end, it caused the people of God to engage in improper way of serving God, whatever that really looked like. It says commit fornication. You know, that's what those occultic people do. They, they, that's how they have their religion is that they engage in weird sexual stuff. And then in addition to that, she caused them to eat. She, she told them it was okay. Now that probably, I would believe that literally happened. Back then, you know what they would do? I went to a, a Lebanese restaurant one time in Lafayette. I don't want to break down the two different ways that Paul talked about it, but on the I can't remember even what the name of the meat was. And I love me some Lebanese food. I love all that Mediterranean food. But it said some, there was some kind of weird word. And Paul said in one of the letters, don't ask. But I, I, I mean, I didn't think of that whenever. I said, what is, what is this mean right here? <laughs> oh, well, we bring it back. Because I knew something was up with this word connected to this piece of goat or whatever I was about to eat. Or I was thinking about it. He said, we bring it back there and we pray over it. So I said, offered to idols. It was in Lafayette. Wow. Yeah, it was in Lafayette. I can't remember the name of the place, but it was over there by, kind of by where my whole neighborhood is. And I'm like, oh, so you bring, and I just couldn't get up. Yeah, yeah, we bring it back there. We pray over it. Not praying no Christian prayer over the meat. That's what they used to do, though. What I need you to understand is during this time frame, and especially in the New Testament, that's a form of occult worship. I told you all the story before, too, about that girl. Whenever I said, yeah, man, I'm a, I, I, I speak in tongues. And she started, and, and well, it's a longer story. She came to the, she worked with me. She said that she went out into the woods with these people and she, and they laid hands on a goat and then they were, and then they were, they killed the goat and then they cooked the goat and then they ate the goat. Okay. And, and she said, cause I asked her, I said, well, oh, you go to church one day? No, I'm, I'm, I'm pagan. I said, oh, what, what does that mean? Well, we, we go out there with the goat in the woods, and she tells me the story. So she leaves work for a few years, and then she comes back. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sassy sometimes. Y'all just pray for me. Because the Lord's doing the work in me. He really is, whether you realize it or not. And, and she was over there, and there was a crowd of people, and somebody called me out. Oh, well, you believe in speaking in tongues? I'm like, yep, you better believe it, my friend. I speak in tongues. I'm so grateful that I do because, I'm, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then she starts clowning me. She starts laughing. Oh, uh -huh, yeah, you know, I'm like, well, hold on a second now, because if you think that's weird, I distinctly remember you telling me four years ago that you went out into the woods with a goat, <laughs> and y'all laid hands on that goat, and then y'all killed it, and, you, and you, I think you even ate the goat. She's like, no, I didn't eat none of that goat. 
I'm like, oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, she said I was kind of freaked out. I'm like, all right, well, don't be making fun of my religion for sure if you're out there in the woods with a goat. Anyway, so this prophet is Jezebel in this literal church was teaching people to eat meat that had been offered to idols. But I want you to understand that this particular Jezebel, even though she's important, God's mentioning her for a different reason. Because, listen, it's bigger than a one person named Jezebel in A.D. 90. Okay, it's the spirit of Jezebel. Thank you. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of disobedience. This spirit had been around long before even the first Jezebel. The first Jezebel was, was King Ahab's wife and a Sidonian king's daughter. I already talked to you about the geography of Tyre and Sidon and how the proximity of that mountain was near Mount Hermon where those fallen angels descended and all that mess took place. And that whole, layer, that whole place is filled with occultic activity. And here Ahab goes and he connects himself to this. And the next thing you know, she's got all these prophets eating at her table. And I guarantee they was doing some prayer over that meat. And they're all over here engaging in all this false doctrine. And what's the end result? The people of God are now not worshiping God. They're worshiping false gods. Right. And that spirit showed up long before Jezebel in Proverbs 7. Go home and read that. That woman is dressed up like a harlot and she is deceiving. That's what she is. She's the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of harlotry, trying to get God's people deceived into going the wrong way and to get caught up in the lie. And what I'm trying to tell you is that spirit is alive and well in the modern church. Amen. They might not be over there like, yeah, give me some more of that meat and eating like literal meat that's been prayed over by whatever. But listen, there's all kind of weird stuff coming into the church. You just got to take my word for it or you don't. Go do your own research. Because I can't even begin to tell you all the weird stuff that goes on. Involving Eastern meditation and what they call contemplative prayer and involving all of these various things. And listen, it gets to the point, I'm closing, promise. It gets to the point where you start to wonder. Again, there's a lot of good churches. I'm not under the impression that we're the only people around here preaching the gospel. But there is a truth of the gospel. And I guarantee you that this social network stuff that people show up for church for is not the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord is that you and I would be changed by the word of God and that we would be walking tabernacles. Let's bring it back full circle. We would be walking tabernacles, housing the presence of God and being a light in the midst of a darkened world and that our light would shine. But we would let him change us on the inside. Hallelujah. And his light would be reflected outwardly. Listen to me. If, if God can change a, a, some high school dropout dude that was sitting on an air conditioner waiting for somebody to bring him some weed to get high and, and, and give, put the love of God on the inside. Surely he can change somebody else somewhere. Amen. And when he starts changing people and filling them up with his presence, hallelujah, the people of the world begin to see the light of the king.